Very wonderful to see you all today in whatever time zone you are joining our science symposium from. I'm Dawn Wright and I'm very honored to be speaking to you from here in Redlands, California, near Esri headquarters, which lies in the traditional territory of the Uhave Adam clan of the Serrano Indians, now within the federally recognized tribal government of the San Manuel Band of Mission Indians. And we are deeply grateful to these original and ongoing caretakers of this land. Let me start our show for you today. And indeed, uh, welcome, finally, to the sixth annual uh, Esri UC Science Symposium. This session is uh, like many others where you can ent uh, enter your questions in, uh, in the, uh, the chat, the Q&A, the Q&A portion of the platform, and we will do our best to, to answer those as quickly as possible. If you're using social media, please use the hashtag Science Symposium. Uh, you can also use the hashtag EsriUC. And yes, to reassure uh, many of you, this session is being recorded and it will be available to you within the conference platform within two hours after this session, including the Q&A portion. For the rest of the world, a recording will also be available uh, on YouTube uh, in perpetuity. And last year's Science Symposium is also still on YouTube. And in all of this, for the virtual logistics for this event, I'd like to give a special, special thanks to Kristen Frith of the Esri Events Marketing Team for her unflagging support of this event. She has been tremendous, as well as to uh, Victoria Phillips in Corporate Science Communication. By way of introduction of myself, again, I'm Dawn Wright. I'm Esri's Chief Scientist and also a full professor of geography and oceanography at Oregon State University. And as chief scientist here at Esri, I foster a program to strengthen the scientific foundation for Esri software and services, especially in the disciplines shown on the slide where we have very strong scientific expertise and productivity ourselves, while also representing Esri to the international scientific community, especially on various boards and councils and research projects. At ESRI, we also work collaborative, collaboratively with some of the world's largest earth science organizations, as well as with amazing individuals such as our keynote speaker. We'd like to invite you to also uh, check out the ESRI UC 2021 Q&A. This is actually a hidden gem. It's one of the single best sources of information on ESRI as a company and on our products and services. It's also based on your questions that were sent to us prior to the UC and uh, it's still available online and searchable. So you can go to the URL that is in yellow here and you can put in a search term such as geographic science and it will return to you valuable information that focuses on specific ArcGIS capabilities and tools, especially for scientists. Realizing that for many of you, Twitter is your preferred discussion forum, as well as the place to get news and content. We also have a popular presence on Twitter at GIS and Science, as well as my personal account, Deep Sea Dawn. They'll be warned that if you uh, uh, go to Deep Sea Dawn, you will also find in my feed other fun content, including Legos, professional cycling, and the adventures of my puppy dog, Riley but there's a lot of science on there as well. We also have a very extensive online science portfolio and that continues to evolve at this URL that you see, esriurl.com slash SCICOM. Uh, it was also the subject of my first column in ARC News and you can get the link to that column uh, in the notes that I will be making available to you in a few minutes. And our uh, program at Esri in terms of science continues to evolve around six 
major initiatives. So we're working very hard on open science, weather and climate science, ocean science, solid earth science, which includes hydrology, agricultural science, terrestrial ecology, terrestrial geology and geophysics, soil science, and, and a lot more. Geographic information science, which is also becoming e increasingly known as spatial data science. And so that includes remote sensing, cartography. Uh, there's information about our new relationship with the Group on Earth Observations, uh, or GEO. And social science, with new sections in this portfolio on the coronavirus response and also racial equity and justice. And we will be having a forthcoming emphasis on qualitative social science. In fact, uh, on Tuesday, we had a terrific tech workshop to launch our new uh, qualitative social science initiative. And that workshop was called Enhancing Qualitative Social Science Research with GIS. And in the notes that you'll see, you can get a link uh, to that recording as well as to the story map that describes that session and that initiative. And as you know, our conference theme this week has been GIS creating a sustainable future. And our science portfolio is actually really the only place in all of Esri.com that points to Esri's own environmental and sustainability statement, which provides a glimpse of what we now have going on behind the scenes in terms of our sustainability strategic plan, our sustainability projects internal to our company, our performance reporting, especially our continued targeting uh, and relentless reduction of greenhouse gas uh, footprint, our greenhouse gas footprint across the company, as well as our own internal ECOS employee resource group. We're also very proud to announce a new microsite uh, on Esri.com which is on climate action planning. And there are sections uh, on this new site about evaluating impact, assessing risks, mitigating and adapting to climate change, and of course, taking action. And in the coming weeks, this microsite will be directly linked into the Esri Science Portfolio as our seventh initiative. Now, Jack briefly shared on day one this awesome project, which is driven by the need for trusted, accessible, and high-resolution global land cover. So there's the new 10-meter resolution uh, global land cover, uh, 2020. And this is going to be, we hope, a game changer for conservation planning, uh, for monitoring change, for uh, all kinds of uh, environmental applications. And we've collaborated on this project with Microsoft, National Geographic, and the Impact Observatory, which is a company that you may not have heard about. The Impact Observatory brings machine and deep learning algorithms and data to bear for sustainability and environmental mon monitoring. So uh, as I mentioned, this project uses uh, a 10 meter near cloud free mosaic produced with Microsoft and the Impact Observatory using Sentinel-2. And it's hosted on Esri's uh, Living Atlas, uh, as well as on Microsoft's planetary computer. And in addition to this, my colleague Sean Breyer and his Living Atlas team, in collaboration with Clark Labs at Clark University, have also just yesterday released Esri Land Cover 2050, and this is a series of maps that aims to predict land cover change into the year 2050 based on decades of satellite observation data from the European Space Agency's Climate Change Initi Initiative. And this map series has been created under a Creative Commons license. So it opens up the use and consumption of the maps in alignment with our commitment to open science and open data. So there's also a, a link to, to that initiative as well as how to get to the high resolution global land cover in, in the notes. Now at the prior two uh, science symposia, we were pleased to announce the publication of the books GIS for Science, 
Applying Mapping and Spatial Analytics. We released Volume 1 in 2019 and Volume 2 last year. And this has been a tremendous uh, undertaking and an even bigger pleasure to work on these books with my co-editor and lead layout designer Christian Harder, along with the terrific editorial assistance of Mark Henry and Keith Mann of Esri Press. And if we were all together in person, I would have them stand up and get the thunderous applause that they so richly deserve. But alas, we are, of course, in this virtual format, so I hope that you will give them some applause where you are within, within Zoom. But I really thank these colleagues for, for helping these books uh, become a reality, uh, working with me and with so many scientists, because this is not your, your average uh, scientific book series, we feel. It's a series that has featured a somewhat unique format in that these books are not just dry research monographs. They are not just atlases. They're actually, as Christian describes them, a cross between Wired Magazine and National Geographic, but written in the uh, more open language of Scientific American and with stories written by top-rated scientists about how many things GIS, including geospatial data science, are a true force multiplier for great science writ large. So each book features these uh, amazing stories with a lot of rich visual content, uh, especially in two-page uh, graphical or photographic spreads. And there's also a special technology showcase section at the end of each book which features vignettes about Esri's own contributions to science. And volume two includes an additional special section on the GI science response to COVID-19. Now this year, I'm very, very pleased to announce the forthcoming publication of the third and final volume in this series. It's newly entitled GIS for Science, volume three, Maps for Saving the Planet. So this third volume pivots even more sharply than the prior two volumes to focus on biodiversity. It follows the same format, but consists of stories by scientists such as our keynote speaker and her colleague, Regan Smythe, who are literally creating the maps that are helping to save this planet. These stories uh, really focus on biodiversity through the lens of global satellite observation, forestry, marine policy, artificial intelligence, and of course, conservation biology and environmental education. So each one of you today attending this session as a special treat for joining us uh, in this session, especially those of you who are joining so very, very early in the morning, you will uh, or you are going to receive a pre-release copy of this book. Actually, uh, we're going to give you the link right now and the pre-release copy is in the form of a flip book. Really cool. It's something that you only need a web browser uh, to, in order to enjoy the book. You don't have to download anything. We do ask you though, not to distribute the link widely, not to distribute the link actually at all, because we're still working toward the final, final version uh, of the book that will be officially on sale in both print and e-copy sometime in October. So what you are receiving now is an uncorrected proof uh, intended uh, just uh, for, this, for this special event. And so now with a drum roll, are you ready for, for the link? This is the link that you can go to in order to uh, get the flip book. Again, you don't need to download this. This is something that you read in the browser. And I'm gonna pause for a second if you want to take a screen snapshots or write down this link. It's go.esri.com slash GIS, GIS dash four dash science dash three. And we hope you really, really enjoy this. The entire book uh, is in this uh, flip book format. So from cover to cover, you can read about these uh, amazing, amazing stories and see uh, more about the uh, fantastic technology that has been brought to bear. In addition to this, a site that is completely public 
and is live right now is the book's companion website at gisforscience.com. And this is a companion to all of the chapters that are featured in Volume 3. There are a dozen chapters and there are 15 technology showcase vignettes by Esri staff. There are literally hundreds of data sets and web maps and apps and story maps and videos, workflows, Python notebooks, journal articles, many of them open access journal articles, learn lesson tutorials, and much more on this very, very rich companion site. In fact, a lot of people tend to use this companion site a bit more than the book itself. We've done this uh, to, of course, supplement what the authors have written about and to also uh, offer this as a supplemental teaching and research resource as well. So please go to gisforscience.com. Now that concludes uh, all of the uh, announcements. And uh, finally, I want to get to the heart uh, of the symposium. So I'll take just a, a couple more minutes before I turn things over to our speaker. Again, if you are live tweeting, please use the hashtags in the upper right here. Hashtag Science Symposium, hashtag uh, EsriUC. And if you want the slides that I'm presenting to you, you can go now to esriurl.com slash symposium 21. We have had a marvelous time with this event. Uh, it's been a highlight for so many of us. And in the first three years of this event, we followed a format where the chosen keynote speaker was not a GIS specialist. And we did that by design. We chose noted scientists who had a strong, compelling vision for improving and protecting the planet, along with a very healthy respect for G GIS, geospatial technology. Then we followed those keynotes with a conversational reaction panel that was deliberately made up of GIS specialists so that they could respond to the vision of the keynoter from the perspective of geospatial and discuss further how best to use GIS to implement the vision laid out by the keynoters. And this was a, a lovely uh, format to have, especially in San Diego, in person with the hundreds of attendees. In 2019, we went to a bit of a different format where we featured a tag team of two top scientists who also have deep GIS expertise, and they spoke on the topic science and service to society, uh, and they focused on climate risks. But instead of having a, a reaction panel, we went straight to a Q&A, especially so that we would have enough time for, for the beer and the bubbly and the snacks uh, afterwards. Last year, of course, you know that everything was, was virtual. So uh, we had a virtual format for the Science Symposium as well, and we had just enough time in that format to enjoy the presentation of the award-winning climate scientist, Catherine Hayhoe, and then went straight to uh, Q&A there. And we will be doing, uh, using that same format uh, this year. So we are going to now have a wonderful, beautiful keynote address by uh, my friend and fellow chief scientist, uh, Healy Hamilton, Dr. Healy Hamilton of NatureServe. Now, I hope you are already familiar with NatureServe, but if not, NatureServe is a Western Hemisphere Biodiversity Information Network, and it's focused on the management and conservation of at-risk species and ecosystems. Now, Healy is a biodiversity scientist by training with graduate degrees from Yale and UC Berkeley, and she has extensive field experience in the tropical forest of Latin America. So at NatureServe, <coughs> excuse me, had to take a water break there. At NatureServe, she leads a staff with expertise in ecology, zoology, botany, conservation, data science, and information management. And together, they deliver these amazing uh, foundational uh, informations on the distribution, the conservation status, and the trends of species and their habitats. Now Healy is also a world expert on the taxonomy and evolution of seahorses and their relatives, which is why I'm wearing my special seahorse uh, t-shirt for her uh, today. 
Healy is also an elected member of the Executive Committee of the IUCN, U.S. National Committee. She's an honorary fellow of the World Conservation Monitoring Center. She's a contributor to the IUCN Species Survival Commission for Seahorses and Pipefish, and a member of the Key Biodiversity Areas Committee. Healy is the recent past president of the absolutely awesome Society for Conservation GIS. She's a Switzer Foundation uh, Environmental Leadership Fellow and a former U.S. Fulbright Scholar. And as mentioned before, she is a contributing author, not only to volume three of GIS for Science, but she is also featured in another Esri Press volume three, that is the Women and GIS volume three, Champions of a Sustainable World that just came out. So with no further ado, let me hand over now to uh, the fantastic Healy Hamilton. And Healy, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome and take it away. Dawn, my goodness, thank you so much for that fabulous introduction. And I was so pleased to hear all of the introductory comments you had about the important work that Esri is doing on open science and all the different initiatives that you have underway. It's been an amazing week uh, at the UC. I look forward to seeing a lot of sessions that I missed uh, on YouTube later. So it's wonderful that you're providing that opportunity. Uh, I am so honored to be in this incredibly prestigious venue uh, to be able to share with you some of my thoughts about uh, biodiversity. This is, it's the theme of the, the next and last in the series, GIS for Science book. And it's very appropriate that it's the theme for uh, our, my talk today. Uh, and I am greatly honored to be on this stage, uh, able to share not only some of my thoughts, but some of the work that NatureServe has done in the field of biodiversity conservation, leveraging a network of experts and da data science, spatial data technology and tools. So let me uh, quickly here try to uh, work the technology to share my screen, but of course it has to be the right screen. And uh, give me one moment. So I'm gonna stop that share for a second, go back <laughs> to the PowerPoint, get the right screen going. This is always, the most stressful part of starting a keynote. All right, now share the right screen and we should be good to go. Uh, so Dawn, can you confirm or someone confirm that you are seeing the correct title slide yes. screen? You're Thank you so much. Great. <laughs> okay. So, you know, I mean, I really wish, of course, that we could all be together in San Diego and that we'd have this opportunity to see and interact with one another in person. Uh, but we've all adjusted as best we can to this virtual form of communication. And often we've found that in many cases, it actually extends the inclusivity and the reach of our messages. So I, I appreciate that you are willing to uh, engage in yet another remotely delivered presentation. I encourage you to use the platform that Esri has offered in order to send any questions or comments that you have at any point during this talk, as we will definitely leave some time at the end for discussing your reactions to uh, any of the material that I present here today. Uh, I also ask that you bear with me regarding any delays that you might experience in the streaming process as my data goes from here through Esri system to your system, um, but I will do my best to, to maintain uh, sort of the experience of you being connected to what you're seeing and hearing as the presentation uh, moves through. So my talk today is divided into three sections. So first, you know, I know that everyone listening here today understands that biodiversity is important, but I'm gonna take some time to provide just a few examples to maybe remind us more deeply of just how much the well-being of each of us individually, of our communities, of our societies, 
and of humanity itself is utterly dependent on the natural world. Even though we don't always behave and acknowledge uh, that truly incontrovertible fact. So given that the conservation of the diversity of life is so essential, I'll talk a little bit about approaches we use to uh, understand its status and achieve its conservation. And then finally, I'll turn to the story of NatureServe and how we are leveraging people and data and technology to become more spatially precise about with our conservation information so we can better balance the sometimes competing needs of conservation and economic development. So let's start with the basics, right? We don't often think in these terms, but every single calorie ever consumed by all of mankind in all of human history comes from biodiversity. And supplying enough safe and nutritious food for a rapidly growing world really requires that we increase food production globally without undermining the planet's capacity to meet the needs of future generations and to deliver other essential ecosystem services that we'll talk about more a little later. What is a solution to this challenging balancing act? It's diversity, which our current food production system does not leverage. There's tens of thousands of edible plant species, but only a few hundred that contribute significantly to our current food supplies. And literally so many of our calories are come from just 15 crop plants that are feeding about 90% of the food energy intake for the world. And just three, rice and maize and wheat, are the staple crops for over 4 billion people. But we know that as climate patterns change, the conditions for growing crops change as well. And the yield of our principal food sources becomes less secure. And this is especially true when so many people depend on so few species. So here's an example of a culture that is reversing that trend. The Dongriyas are one of the most traditional tribes of India, and they live in, a remote, in remote hamlets that are scattered throughout the Niamgiri hill, hill Range in southern Orissa, which is a state in the country's eastern limb. And they once grew uh, a diversity of what are now considered heirloom rice varieties, but they started losing their self-sufficient food systems when the forest became degraded due to logging and the government introduced and subsidized these high yielding rice varieties. So from a, a historically a diverse indigenous farming system, the Dongrias gravitated towards rice monoculture and they lost some of the diversity and resilience of their, their food production system in the process. But following a series of recurrent droughts and erratic rainfall that led to an agrarian crisis, the Dongrias are on a mission now to return to their farming roots. So they have a uh, renewed sense of their rights after they successfully ousted a UK-based mining company in a much publicized resistance in 2013. And with a little help from grassroots organization called Living Farms, the tribe began resuscitating their lost seed varieties. So they now sow close to 50 different varieties of seeds that are intermixed on a single farm millet and grains and pulses and beans and oil seeds and tubers and vegetables all together. They've created a seed bank and a seed exchange program in recognition of the simple fact that diversity equals food security. And in a rapidly changing world, this statement applies not just to the Dongria culture in remote hills of Eastern India, but to all human societies, especially those that are most vulnerable. And of course, our food security does not just depend on the crops we plant and harvest. Biodiversity itself is a partner in agricultural productivity. We cannot reap what we sow without the pollination services that we receive for free from ants and from flower flies and moths and bees and birds and mammals. There's been an increased focus in the last couple decades on studying the economic value of nature's pollination services 
And the numbers are completely staggering. I mean, I had to put all of the zeros onto this slide so that we could see that the biodiversity services that are provided for free by pollination, they're estimated to range from 200 billion to $400 billion every year. That is not a replaceable service. Food security and pollination services are, are a, a foundational delivery uh, of uh, a foundational gift from the diversity of life, but that's not all. Evolution has produced an almost inexhaustible array of molecular entities, which in turn provide sort of infinite resources for modern science to use in drug development. And there's been billions of years of chemical evolution, and it's produced a pharmacopoeia that is far more advanced and creative than what we can think to synthesize in labs. So literally since time immemorial, natural products have been the backbone of traditional systems of healing throughout the globe, and they still are today. About half of the drugs approved during the last 30 years are either directly or indirectly derived from natural products. Here's why it matters uh, what the, about the diversity of uh, species that we can use to apply to medicines. Uh, this can only be true if the diversity of life is sustained. So an example of the medical cost of extinction is the gastric brooding frog. Uh, this was discovered only in 1972 in the mountains of Queensland, Australia. In 1974, scientists discovered how it reproduced. The mother frog converts her stomach into a womb. She swallows her own eggs and stops making hydrochloric acid in her stomach to avoid digesting her own young. So then over the next six weeks, around 20 to 25 tadpoles hatch inside of her and grow. And eventually she throws them up, spews them into the world as fully formed little froglets. If this amphibian could deliberately stop making acid in its stomach, it might provide new ways of treating ulcers. Uh, but the frog was last seen in the wild in 1981 and the last captive individual died in 1983 and the species was gone. It's no more. This is their habitat in the Queensland forest of Australia that's threatened by feral pigs, invasive weeds, polluted waters. The chytrid fungus also probably played a role in their demise. It's not just species on land, but also from the ocean that have incredible potential as future medicines. So sea cucumbers, which are not exactly as cute and cuddly as seahorses, uh, they have amazing properties that may lead to future treatment for stroke victims they can regenerate their central nerve cord. Parkinson's disease and Huntington's disease and central nervous system disorders following strokes. Cures for all of these aff afflictions are challenged by the fact that regeneration of neurons in the mammalian spinal cord has not been possible. But these sea cucumbers have amazing regenerative properties that could serve as model systems for understanding how we can get a nervous system to regenerate. Just an example, a couple examples of the diversity of life and how it's directly connected, not just to our well being today, but to opportunities for improving human health in the future. So, the example of the sea cucumber is sort of where biomedicine meets biomimicry. This is a relatively new science that uses inspiration from the diversity of life to solve engineering problems. Like how do we reduce the resistance of, of the flow of air or water over surfaces? Well, nature has figured that out. Or how do we create materials that are both light and incredibly strong? Well, nature, nature has figured that out through, through bones and tree trunks. So biomimicry is an active way of looking for inspiration from nature to solve uh, real world engineering problems. And here is a new engineering inspiration with an ultra cool name, the diabolical ironclad beetle. This beetle can withstand the crushing force of almost 40,000 times its own body weight. 
It turns out that there are microstructures in the beetle's armor that basically make it impossible to squish. This fly-through animation of the abdomen of the diabolical ironclad beetle, which is generated from tomographic data, um, it's showing three types of microstructures that create its armor. One that is interdigitated, one that is latching, and one that is freestanding. And the layers can like crackle and separate individually without the entire shell breaking at once. And uh, a common engineering issue is the, that the point at which any two plates of any material join together is often the weakest. And as you can see in the bottom right image, the beetle has solved this with this interlocking pattern of jigsaw pieces. This is just so incredibly cool. And this type of strength against impacts and resistance to shattering would be incredibly useful in engineering things like body armor or buildings or bridges or aircraft, um, but body armor uh, would be pretty cool. Beetles represent the greatest diversity of any group of animals. There are more than 340,000 species that have been described worldwide, including nearly 30,000 species just in North America. And because of this incredible diversity, we don't know that much about their conservation status, but of those beetles that have documented population trends, over 60% of them are known to be declining. Biodiversity is the fabrics in the clothes on our back. It's the sheets of the bed in the, in the bed that we sleep in. It's the padded comfort of the rugs that we're walking on. I mean, plants and animals are providing these materials that we rely on every single day. Biodiversity from forests provides the wood and the thatch that frames the buildings that we live in or the paper products that we use. I mean, we rely on biodiversity every day in so many ways without necessarily acknowledging it. But the value of biodiversity does not just lie in its direct benefits of food or medicine or materials, or even some of the indirect benefits like the ecosystem service we described of pollination. Species actually shape their environment. Many species are ecosystem engineers that cause physical state changes in their environment, either directly or indirectly affecting the availability of resources to other species. That is species modify, maintain, and create habitats. So in this desert landscape, there are species that dig holes that become wells where willows and cottonwoods germinate, serving as nurseries for desert trees. Uh oh. Did yeah. You're fine, Haley. You're fine. Okay. Everything's moving. Everything. All right. Thank you. I just. It looks like uh, the screen. Just want to make sure the right screen is still showing. Thank you. So, equids, horses, and their relatives are actually uh, able to engineer desert water availability by digging wells. And in doing so, they create oases that in turn support this huge array of other wildlife. Over three summers, there were camera traps set up at four sites in the Sonoran Desert and at one site in the Mojave to observe these um, equids bio bioengineering their surroundings. And what, was, what we saw is that these holes that fill with water end up being oases, they're boons to wildlife. Badgers and black bears and birds, including, including declining species such as the elf owls showed up and scrub jays and other mammals like mule deer and bighorn sheep and badgers and even Colorado river told, toads. So almost 60 species came to these wells to drink. Um, and so the species richness at the wells was over 60% higher than at the control sites uh, showing that these animals are intentionally visiting these equid ma equine made wells. So the desert is actually being shaped and formed by uh, these ecosystem engineers. Donkeys and horses are very capable diggers and they can shovel sand and gravel backwards with their front hooves, 
but they're not the only species that exhibit this behavior. It's found across the world with both native and introduced feral animals. We've really just begun to understand the extent to which biodiversity shapes the world around us. And examples of ecosystem engineering is not only found on land, right, but also in the oceans. And perhaps the greatest example is coral reefs. This is just one section of the Great Barrier Reef, which is the single biggest structure made by living organisms in the world, 300,000 square kilometers across, composed of and built by billions of tiny coral polyps. So just to recognize that our planet has been physically shaped by the diversity of life in ways that most of us don't fully appreciate. And in an era of rapid global change, we're finding that many ecosystems are far more valuable than previously understood. We knew seagrass beds help buffer coastlines by absorbing the impact of storm surge. And we knew they provide habitat for many commercially important marine species. But they also remove carbon from the atmosphere way faster than tropical rainforests. And even though they cover less than one fifth of 1% of the seafloor, they're responsible for about 10% of the carbon uptake from the ocean. Mangroves are also natural carbon scrubbers. They remove CO2 from the atmosphere and stash it away in their rich soils. Their underwater labyrinth root structure are ideal fish nurseries. They have fast growing above ground wood biomass that's used for construction and firewood. And they're also good ecosystems for, for beekeeping and producing honey. It's like the closer that we look, the more we understand that the natural world in all of its genetic and chemical and biological and ecological diversity in its interactions and processes and in all of its beauty and fragility, nature is the key to our own well being as individuals, as families, as communities. So, how we manage the natural world will determine the future quality of life on Earth. And that's the theme for the rest of my talk. How will we manage the natural world to protect what is left and to restore what is degraded? To do this, I want to demonstrate just how much placed based data, spatial data, is essential. So here's some elephants in Africa. And because we live in the era of the Anthropocene, this fate of nature, including these elephants, which I hope I has con have convinced you now is inextricable to our own fate, the fate of nature will be decided by our actions. So I wanna dive into this science of conservation with the unprecedented data and tools that we have to inform our actions, to determine which places are the most important to protect and to figure out how to minimize the competition for resources that we see here between people and wildlife. And why does this topic deserve to be the headline of the 2021 Esri Science Symposium? Just because, right? The answer to these questions is largely spatial in nature. So this is one example by the, shown by the animated tracks of three bull elephants, Imara, Uzima, and Tumaini in Laikipa, Kenya. Using spatial data and technology, the NGO Space for Giants is confronting the conflict that was created by human settlement encroaching on what was sparsely settled areas. And so they fit the elephants with collars carrying chips linked to satellites, mapped their movement, and figured out which areas have the highest densities to create a solution that allowed for people and elephants to coexist. So how will we manage the natural world to protect what's left, to restore what is degraded? To answer this, we have to assess and map humanity's influence across the earth. And thanks to powerful computing, to a network of earth observing satellites and new bottom up census and crowdsourced data, our ability to do this has greatly evolved. So here we're looking at cumulative pressure maps that combine remotely sensed and ground-based observation data 
that are increasingly used to spatially assess a wide range of human pressures seen here in the stack on the left. These approaches facilitate the mapping of Earth's remaining wilderness, right? We can identify those pressures, acquire or develop data on those individual pressures, assign uh, relative pressure scores to individual pressures, and then stack them up, analyze them, and overlay them. That allows us to facilitate the mapping of Earth's remaining wilderness, improve estimates of extinction risks, help us monitor the status of existing protected areas and to guide decisions about where new protections will be effective at conserving biodiversity. So the results of human footprint analyses are pretty sobering in their reality, but I hope also motivating in their sense of urgency. Here, we're looking at pie charts of most of the major terrestrial ecosystems where the size of the circle relates to the, the aerial extent on the surface of the terrestrial earth of that ecosystem. And you know, red to light green to dark green shows the extent of human modification with the dark green being what's left of intact wilderness according to this analysis. So they provide though a spatially explicit understanding of the state of human pressure on the natural environment. And they're emphasizing the need to protect what's left of intact wilderness, but also the need and the importance and the opportunity to restore what has been modified. If we peer more closely into those data, they demonstrate the importance of existed protecting areas. So you can see here how Mount Kenya World Heritage Site shows up as an island of green, an island of intactness, surrounded by varying degrees of landscape modification by humans. Protected areas are a foundational tool in conserving biodiversity. I would love to point you to the Protected Planet Report that came out last year. It's, it comes out every couple years to help us answer the question, how are we doing in protecting life on our planet? So led by the United Nations, United Nations Environment Program, World Conservation Monitoring Center, and the International Union for the Conservation of Nature's World Commission on Protected Areas, this year, the report is a beautifully produced live, all digital assessment that is filled with maps and spatial analyses, not just about where protected areas have been established, but also how well do they represent the diversity of earth species and ecosystems? And how effectively are they being managed? And how isolated or connected they are? So I really encourage you to check out the Protected Planet Report. And inside that report, it's an interesting year because we are now recognizing that there are communities and cultures that can effectively conserve biodiversity in situ outside of the Western concept of parks and protected areas. So there's been an increasing effort to recognize and map what are called uh, OECMs or other effective area-based conservation measures such as a locally managed marine area that is effectively protected to support fish stocks, but may not have formal recognition as a protected area. So this is a welcome and inclusive and necessary shift in our understanding of what do we mean by conservation and what do we mean by protection? Systems of governance and management that deliver effective biodiversity conservation, no matter how formal or informal they are, need recognition. And this year's Protected Planet Report is beginning to provide that recognition. The conservation community has made great strides recently in developing standardized approaches to how we identify and delineate the places that are the most essential for the persistence of biodiversity. Key biodiversity areas are built on more than 30 years of experience in identifying important sites for different taxonomic, ecological, and thematic subsets of biodiversity. I mean, previously, we had sort of a, a wide diversity of approaches for defining what was important to conserve that actually undermined our conservation goals. I mean, we had 
biodiversity hotspots and important bird areas and Alliance for Zero Extinction sites and important plant areas and prime butterfly areas and even important fungus sites. And pretty soon almost everywhere was an important area for conserving some element of biodiversity to somebody. And so the key biodiversity area standard, which was launched at the World Conservation Congress in Hawaii in 2016, it was 10 years and hundreds of consultations in the making. And it brings a set of standardized criteria to the identification of important sites for biodiversity. And while we're still far from a complete assessment of key biodiversity areas in terrestrial, marine, and freshwater realm, collectively, these sites represent the most rigorous aggregated data set that yet exists on the areas that are critical for conserving the diversity of life. So this supports national governments and multinational corporations and international developments and conservation investors all of them can evaluate their activities and develop their priorities using this information as a guide in their decision making. So here are a few major, major recent global biodiversity assessments that are built on data that are developed from local and national and regional and global scale data sets using observation data, using remotely sensed data and ecological modeling among other tools. They help us understand what has happened to the natural world in this time of intense change. Over the past 50 years, the human population has doubled, the global economy has grown nearly fourfold, and global trade has grown tenfold, which is driving extraordinary demand and increasing demand for energy and materials. These assessments clearly tell us that our demands to the extent that they have been met, which we know is inequitable across the planet, these demands are coming at an enormous cost to the natural world. How do we reduce those costs? How do we leverage data and technology and networks to reduce the conflict between conservation and development? So basically for the rest of this talk, I'm gonna focus on how NatureServe is approaching the answers to those questions here in the United States. So we're gonna go back in time to the, to the beginning, to the birth of a, of a movement. So Earthrise, this photograph taken over 50 years ago is probably the most influential environmental photo that was ever taken. It's the first time that we saw our little blue marble from space and sort of recognized how, how fragile and delicate and unique it is in the known universe. So this photo inspires an environmental awareness movement of a nation that is seeking clean water and pure air and to, to sustain its magnificent natural heritage of wildlife and wild places. And so in 1970, we have Earth Day demonstrations. The demands of millions, over 20 million people that participated in the first Earth Day. They want to, they drive legislation for clean air, for clean water, for the protection of imperiled species via the Endangered Species Act, which gets signed into law by President Nixon in 1973. And it creates a mandate for the federal government to protect and recover species that are at risk of extinction. And I have to, you know, I look at this photograph and these crowds and these posters, and it's kind of amazing. Uh, it's almost like a time warp because we could have that exact same type of uh, protest today. So suddenly conservation scientists are faced with the need to answer some fundamental questions about biodiversity if the Endangered Species Act is going to be uh, properly implemented. Fundamental questions like, how do we know what species in what places are actually at risk? So in 1974, the Nature Conservancy is sort of recognizing this need to discover and document and understand biodiversity at the scale of a nation in order to protect and conserve it. Uh, the scientists at the Nature Conservancy conceive of a network of natural heritage programs in every state that are designed to answer the fundamental questions about what species exist, where they are found, and how they are doing. And so 
TNC started establishing natural heritage programs beginning with South Carolina and Mississippi in 1974. And each of those programs is dedicated to systematically inventorying native species, documenting their distributions in the field and determining their conservation status. The world's first biodiversity information network is born. And the network quickly grows throughout the US and spread into Canada and um, some partnerships in Latin America uh, where those programs are called conservation data centers to become a Western hemisphere biodiversity information network. And this is a network now called the NatureServe Network since we spun off in 2000 as an independent organization. The NatureServe Network records and compiles and analyzes and shares the highest quality scientific information we have at, at scale on what species and ecosystems are present, where they occur, how they are doing, and what we can do to conserve them. So from the beginning, from its inception, this, the NatureServe network has developed and shared methods, uh, standardized methods for its observation and assessments of species and ecosystems. And since its earliest days, the network has pioneered technological advances in biodiversity data management. So we've been able to, since the beginning, use these shared data standards and these data management tools to allow us to seamlessly aggregate information, uh, in this case, at the scale of our nation. In 1993, the first aggregated view across the, the network at that time, looking at the network data to understand uh, the status and species of data uh, across these jurisdictions, right, the network publishes perspectives on species imperilment. It's analyzing the role of public lands in sustaining threatened and endangered species. And it is only possible because of the network wide shared data and standards, the methodologies and the computerized information management systems that are part of our DNA since uh, the beginning. So the data that is collected by natural heritage programs is not just focused on charismatic vertebrates like birds and mammals and amphibians. This chart again shows aggregated data here in the US for the conservation status of specific taxonomic groups. So NatureServe conservation status assessments have been conducted on tens of thousands of species, including bees and butterflies and freshwater mussels and crayfish and almost 20,000 plant species. So the combined red and orange and yellow are species whose conservation status are at various levels of risk while the blues represent uh, groups that are more secure. And that vertical red line depicts our best estimate of the percentage of each group that is at risk. And if you see that line at the top for all species, it's a third, a third of all species that we have assessed are facing some kind of risk. This is information that we only can discover, share and act on because of 50 years of standard data and management uh, by NatureServe and its network programs. So this information is only useful if they're accessible. And over 20 years ago, we started doing that. We launched NatureServe Explorer, which, was an, which is an, a free online encyclopedia of life. And it gives the public access for the first time to NatureServe's vast data on species and ecosystems. And last year, we we redesigned it. So we now have a far more modern and functional NatureServe Explorer, which we invite you to explore. So that's a brief history and purpose of how our data and our network and our uh, biodiversity information management systems have uh, were born and have evolved. And so here we are. This slide says 2020 um, because that's what the data represents on it. I do, I do know it's 2021. Um, so it's 2021, right? So for over nearly 50 years, our network has amassed over a million mapped locations of species populations with a focus on those that are rare and imperiled. And these data, as unique and as valuable as they are, they still only represent our collective opportunity and whatever resources were available 
for actually sampling biodiversity on the ground in nature. They are incomplete. They're incomplete. But decisions about conserving the diversity of life are spatial in nature. We have to find ways to improve the coverage and the resolution of our understanding of one of the most fundamental of all conservation questions. Where do imperiled species exist? So we are leveraging data and technology and people to answer that question. So I'm going to jump straight into a practical real world example from Texas, a state actually that has a lot of rare and imperiled species, both aquatic and terrestrial, yet a very limited extent of protected areas and almost exclusively private land. Conservation in Texas is going to happen mostly on private land. So it's got to be smart. It's got to be targeted. So these are planned road construction or road widening projects that are on the books in the Texas Department of Transportation over the next few years. These guys look like they're going to be pretty busy. And here is this beautiful, rare and highly endangered neotropical migratory songbird, the aptly named golden cheeked warbler. Its only habitat in the US is juniper oak woodlands in central Texas. It's actually the only bird that occurs in the US whose range is restricted to the state of Texas. So there's a lot of incentive to conserve this species. It has the full weight of the US Endangered Species Act behind it because it is federally listed as endangered. So this kicks in a lot of regulations for anyone, including the Department of Transportation, who wants to undertake activities that could potentially impact this beautiful little warbler. But if you want to know where it occurs during the breeding season, which is when it's found in Texas, if you look at bird range maps or at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service website, you get a map covering a huge swath of central Texas. The map on the left with the bright blue dots, that represents the confirmed occurrence records from the Texas Natural Diversity Database, which is the NatureServe Network Program in Texas. These observations, they're made by qualified experts. They're called element occurrences, which are spatially explicit delineation of areas known to be of importance for the persistence of the golden cheek warbler. Not just any old observation, right? But high quality and of conservation value. But here's the issue, right? These element occurrences are the highest confidence records we have, but we know they are an underrepresentation. We never have the opportunity or the resources to conduct comprehensive field surveys that can identify all the golden, golden cheek warbler habitat, especially not in Texas. So more commonly, we use what's on the right here, course range maps or county boundaries in jurisdiction where the species is, is known or suspected to occur, This like this map on the right. But we definitely know this is over predicting the distribution of our target species. Habitat is almost never suitable throughout the entire range represented by these broad range maps. And yet, these two maps represent the two approaches that are the most widely used data inputs for our spatial conservation analyses, for our management decisions, for inventories in the field or mitigation efforts for road construction projects. But if we're going to be effective and efficient about identifying conservation actions, if we're going to find ways to reduce conflicts with infrastructure or agriculture or other land uses, we need to drastically improve the precision of our spatial data for species at risk. Today, uh, we can defensively do exactly that by leveraging NatureServe's history of high quality species occurrence records, by embracing modern tools of predictive modeling, by accessing increasingly available high resolution data characterizing the environment, and by leveraging advances in data science and cloud computing, we can defensively uh, dramatically improve our precision in this understanding. So for any species like the golden cheek warbler, we can combine the verified occurrences in the map on the left with the suite of environmental conditions that occur in those places, and we can use machine learning to produce a map of where else in the environment that the combination of conditions occur. So here on the right, the yellow to red map is a spatially explicit hypothesis of the distribution of habitat that is suitable for the warbler 
where the more highly suitable habitat is in red and lower suitability is in yellow. We can then threshold that output to produce a high resolution map um, of the areas of highest probability of suitable habitat for the warbler. So now, instead of using our original approaches on the left, right, either only the confirmed records in blue or the big broad range map in beige, which we know are likely to either underrepresent or overrepresent species distributions, we have a high resolution, reproducible, like well documented, testable spatial hypothesis that helps us refine our understanding of where any given imperiled species may occur. So we can now go back to the Texas Department of Transportation construction plans with a far more precise understanding of where transportation infrastructure and endangered warblers might actually be in conflict. And as it turns out, compared to a broad range map, uh, there is a lot less conflict that's likely than would otherwise be anticipated. And where there is conflict, we can focus our resources appropriately. The, the new maps can help guide ground survey efforts. They can identify options for avoiding warbler habitat. They can direct Department of Transportation to the agencies or the landowners that might be mit partners in mitigating any adverse impacts. This kind of spatial precision can inform the balancing act that we, uh, that we face between conservation and economic development. And so as some of you may have heard in previous talks that NatureServe has had the honor of giving at ESRI conferences, NatureServe is fully embracing the integration of our 50 years of high quality imperiled species records with spatial data on the environment, modern ecological modeling approaches and cloud computing. So with support from ESRI, uh, support and partnership with the Nature Conservancy, with Microsoft and with uh, experts all across our network with those natural heritage programs throughout the US, uh, we've produced a suite of national analyses that we call the Map of Biodiversity Importance or MOBI for short. Um, by developing these individual habitat models for a very diverse taxonomic suite of over 2,200 imperiled species. And then we've aggregated and analyzed these data to reveal spatial patterns of imperiled biodiversity at unprecedented taxonomic and spatial resolution. The map of biodiversity importance or MOBI is actually a series of 15 maps in all. There's three different spatial analyses for five different taxonomic groups. So this map is called range size rarity and it's analyzed for all 2,216 species. This analysis, um, the range size rarity analysis, it places greater weight on imperiled species with narrower ranges because those small ranges translate to fewer opportunities for conservation interventions. So the brighter orange to yellow areas indicate uh, where modeled habitat for multiple narrow range endemic species occurs. I can show you what it looks like zoomed in. This is a species richness map for aquatic invertebrates in the southeastern US. And here the brighter the yellow, the brighter individual stream reaches, the higher the imperiled species diversity based on the MOBI analyses. So you might not spend a ton of time thinking about the importance of the conservation of crayfish or freshwater mussels, uh, but actually the southeastern US is globally significant for its diversity of freshwater invertebrates. Uh, and if you, you know, they are essential parts of the aquatic food chain. If you like fishing, you need to care about these critters. They help maintain water quality, they cycle nutrients, and as a group, they are the most imperiled element of biodiversity in our country. They've suffered the most extinctions, and almost half of remaining species are at risk. So the MOBI maps, all 15 of them are freely available on the Living Atlas where I just checked last night, they've been accessed over 25,000 times, which is pretty good for biodiversity maps. And they're being used right now by organizations like the Pew Charitable Trust, by the Nature Conservancy, by the electric power industry to guide land management and conservation investment decisions. And let me just 
clarify how much of an advance this is. So the first map that came out the, was the biodiversity hotspot map that we had generated previously that was NatureServe's most in-demand aggregated data product. And it was, it was the, the best we could do analyzing the aggregated element occurrences um, at that point from over about 40 years of our uh, of activity across our network. So this is what it looked like before, zoomed in to an area of Texas. This is what we have today. I mean, that is transformational in our ability to bring precision to the, the conservation of imperiled species in our nation. So the MOBI analyses have allowed us to define a, whole, a new unit of conservation, which we call areas of unprotected biodiversity importance or obbies that are shown here in yellow. These are places with high probability of suitable habitat for imperiled species that have narrow geographic ranges that fall outside of our current protected area estate. So these, most of these areas represent habitat for more than one imperiled species with an average of five co-occurring at any one of these yellow areas. So this map is a result of using decades of observation data combined with modern tools of spatial analysis to try to democratize precision conservation to prevent species extinctions. This is the kind of map that can support land trusts and private landowners, foresters and ranchers and farmers, federal and state agencies to conserve that diversity of life that we were so lucky to inherit as a nation. And finally, I am wrapping up now. Finally, MOBI is not just a set of static map products. It's also a process. So this slide depicts this iterative dynamic process that, that we set up and that will continue to run and grow to continue to improve this data. So each of the species habitat models that underlies the map of biodiversity importance, it needs to be dynamic and updatable as new surveys are conducted and new occurrence records are obtained as data on the climate or environment changes. Our modeling system needs to be accessible to the scientists all across the NatureServe network. So with a lot of support from Microsoft's AI for Earth program um, and also from Esri, we've built this dynamic iterative modeling process in the Azure cloud. That cloud-based modeling system houses a library of over 250 terrestrial and freshwater environmental data sets that in, modeling, in this modeling are called predictor data with support from a, an amazing team, Sean Breyer and his incredible team at the Living Atlas program. Uh, we've developed this library so that the environmental characteristics where a given imperiled species is known to occur can be really finely parsed and to maximize our ability to capture that environmental envelope and those conditions that are the strongest drivers of a species distribution. And being sort of the data and standards people, uh, our modeling process also captures metadata that supports the application of habitat models to management decision making. So in partnership with several um, federal agencies, we recently published a framework for assessing model confidence at each step in the modeling process. And that metadata, which is generated every time a, a model is iterated, uh, it produces an assessment for that specific model so that we can measure model confidence from the perspective of the users that are making decisions using models about species management. And finally, and perhaps most importantly of all, we've built a tool, a geospatial tool that allows species experts and, and managers to engage with and inform and improve the model results. I mean, model outputs are just, they're just hypotheses that are spit out from a machine learning algorithm, right? Through this tool, a species expert can evaluate and annotate and revise that hypothesis. They can view the model outputs, add their own observation data, uh, adjust thresholds, provide a review score on a five point scale and annotate the model in various ways. 
And then all of their input is documented and the model can then be rerun through that uh, dynamic process so that um, this is an open and transparent and collaborative process so that the end result, that, that distribution map, that critical data describing where species occurs that happens with increasing precision and increasing confidence keeps improving in an open and collaborative fashion over time. Okay, so wrapping it up and trying to weave it all together, right? There is no magic wand as much as I wish there was to sort of wave away the effects of biodiversity decline and global change. We have created a world in which the abundance and diversity of life that we depend on is diminished. While the seas are warming, rising and acidifying, while where drought and wildfire and extreme events are increasing in frequency, in frequency and intensity, you know, we've turned in to ecosystem engineers and this is the world that we have created. And it's only through a combination of interventions will we face these challenges. So what are our directions? Protect what is left, restore what is degraded. We are ecosystem engineers and we can be better at it, right? If those are the directions, protect what's left, restore what's degraded, that is a spatially explicit set of directions. We need to understand where. The science of where and the science of conservation are absolutely intertwined because you want a world in which there is healthy habitat for magical species like seahorses. Of course, those of you who knew me knew I just had to fit a seahorse in somewhere, right? If the coastal oceans are healthy, then seahorses are thriving. And that means humans that depend on healthy oceans are thriving too. Being the right kind of ecosystem engineer does not need to be a lonely job. I wanna close with this idea of networks because I'm so just honored and grateful to be the chief scientist of the such an amazing network uh, as the one that NatureServe represents. What it means to get involved in engineering the future that we want, right? These challenges that we face in our communities and our societies and even in humanity itself, these challenges can sometimes just be like simply and devastatingly overwhelming. But we have to recognize we live in a time with the most powerful, diverse and creative toolkit to address those challenges that we've ever had, right? Data is pouring in across space and time. Computational capacity to make sense of that data is growing exponentially. And technology, just like it's doing right now today, it can connect us into networks that allow us to solve our common problems in ways never before possible. So this slide is just to strongly encourage you to find the community that shares your passion and deepen your engagement towards those shared values. And if I've been the least bit successful this morning, I really hope those values now include a deepening of your commitment to conserving the diversity of life. Everyone on this call, everyone who will watch this presentation later, we are all part of a community that has a role to play in keeping our planetary web of life intact. So leverage that data, put technology to work for you, invest in and build your network of collaborative, like-minded solution finders. And along the way, you will discover the conservationist that has been inside of you all along. So thank you so much. Thank you, Healy. That was an absolutely marvelous tour de force uh, along so many fronts, beginning from uh, the uh, the idea of how important biodiversity is to to all of us and how our planet has been shaped by the diversity of life in ways that we really have no idea and you really brought that to life that was that was so wonderful and also the uh the idea that spatial is special and the answer to the many many questions that you posed uh, those are largely spatial uh questions and with spatial solutions and speaking of questions, oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, there have been so many fantastic questions coming in. Uh, I have barely been able to keep up uh, in the moderation here. Uh, and I've tried to answer some of the, uh, the basic uh, logistical questions, but there are some 
really great substantive questions uh, that I would like to now uh, pose to you, Healy. We will not have nearly enough time to get to all of them. So uh, maybe we can do a podcast or some other way to, to get to uh, many, many of these, these questions. So uh, if you can uh, just take a deep breath uh, after you have given such a fantastic presentation, we will take uh, probably about the next eight minutes because we only have 10 minutes left. And let me start with, uh, there's one question that came in and then another question that was, was related. And it's very interesting because the, the, the first question is one side of the coin. The second question is uh, apparently the other side. So uh, the first question is, do you believe individual action can help preserve biodiversity? And can restoring small pieces of private property play a role? Or are we better off supporting larger formal efforts that target especially valuable wild areas? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dawn. And I'm glad that we have uh, engaged and mobilized audience here. So I guess my, my response back to the questioners is, why are these mutually exclusive, right? That we absolutely have opportunities as individuals at whatever scale, right? The 40 feet I have in my own backyard, um, I'm lucky enough to have a backyard. The window box I used to have in my grad student apartment in Berkeley uh, that had a few pollinator friendly plants just sitting outside my tiny little kitchen window box. I mean, that, that individual action, not only yes, is it's important, and in fact, science has shown the value of, say, pollinator-friendly gardens planted in cities, where you would think an individual garden wouldn't make that much difference, but aggregated across even an urban environment, uh, there's clear demonstrations of the value of, say, pollinator-friendly uh, garden planting, even in tiny patches. Uh, so not only has that been demonstrated to be important for the conservation of, of biodiversity, but it's also important for your own sense of being connected to nature, for your own sense that you're actually doing what you can in some small way. That I, I just, I can't underestimate how powerful I think that is at opening our eyes and continuing to, to motivate us to be engaged conservationists. Then the, the, the flip side really isn't the other side, it's just another strategy. And it's a different strategy, right? It's one where it's like, who are you working with? What are you, uh, how are you contributing to large landscape conservation? Which we absolutely know also from abundant science is an essential part of how we will conserve biodiversity in an era of global change at scale. And so, both of those are important, and uh, and I would I would not put them as either or. I would say yeah I would say that both are important, and uh, anyone who wants to reach out to me to understand what their options are specifically in their area, I mean I would love to point them to the Center for Large Landscape Conservation, which has uh, a lot of efforts and really acts as a clearinghouse for many different organizations that are trying to bring conservation to scale. Uh, and then the City Nature Challenge is another fabulous opportunity to sort of look at the more urban, small-scale uh, oppor uh, opportunities that there are to in invest in conservation. Mm -hmm. That was a beautiful answer, Healy. And uh, in the interest of time, uh, I don't. Uh, the the other question. I think you have touched on the other the other question already. We really only have time for for one more question uh, before we we wrap up. And so I'll choose uh, this question from a university student who wants to know whether NatureServe uh, has internships for students. We do. We do have internships. I would say go to our website and, and check it out. Uh, there are not a whole lot. NatureServe, as the umbrella organization of the Natural Heritage Network, uh, we're only about 50 or 60 people, uh, but a powerful team. Uh, and we, we do sometimes have internships available. Uh, and in fact, I would like to call out a former NatureServe intern who should be on, on this call right now, Rashi Bhatt from India, 
who was absolutely essential in helping me uh, do research and put this presentation together and who began as an intern at NatureServe and will this fall start her PhD program in uh, environmental justice at the University of San Francisco. So interns to PhD students all the way. All right, fantastic. And Esri also offers uh, summer paid summer internships as well. There are so many more questions that we're not going to get to. Uh, I'm going to do my best to try to, to answer them uh, it, within the Slido uh, platform. Uh, but uh, we will be compiling these questions and we will try to find a way to, to get answers out uh, to, to this fantastic community. Uh, Healy, thank you so much again. Here it's... for you is your oh, uh, wow. award, which will be uh, sent to you. This beautiful award thanking you, one of the, at least, the least we can do is to thank you with such an award and it will be sent to you. Uh, we'll put this in the mail tomorrow, along with a, another little surprise uh, gift for you uh, in, in huge gratitude for, for what you have uh, given to us this morning. Well, Dawn, it's very, it's very mutual. I mean, my biggest gift was that you wore your seahorse t-shirt. That's about as, high, as great a gift as I could right. ask for. And it's been our honor to be included in the um, GIS for Science Volume 3 for both Regan and I to have a chapter in the Women in GIS book. This has been an amazing opportunity to speak to this audience. I love the idea of a follow-up podcast and thank you very much for this opportunity to, uh, to feature this important topic uh, at this venue. Oh, terrific. And the questions are still coming in. Uh, so uh, the, thank you to the audience for being so engaged and, and clearly because of this uh, tremendous presentation. Uh, I'm going to go back to sharing the screen here so that we can uh, give you some uh, launching points here. In fact, we can consider also continuing the discussion and uh, putting some of these questions into Esri community. That is what Esri community is for. And we might uh, set that up so that uh, Healy could uh, respond uh, in those ways because there, there were some general questions, but some that were very specific to the data sets, to the approaches uh, that Healy mentioned uh, in her or described in her presentation. So the sciences community within Esri community is at the link that you see uh, on the screen. This is also uh, within the slide deck that you can once again access via esriurl.com slash symposium 21. And we had a lot of people who missed out on the link to the special flip book, the GIS for Science flip book that uh, is about Mapping Maps for Saving the Planet. That is go.esri.com slash GIS dash four dash science dash three. And once again, this is not something that you need to download. This is a book that is a flip book in your browser. And we are asking that you not spread this around, spread this uh, beautiful secret link around. It is for you uh, as a gift for attending uh, our session in October, around the October time frame, the book will be completely polished and uh, on sale and available in both print and e-copy. And uh, we, we really look forward to having you uh, enjoy it in that form as well. Uh, also within the book, you'll find out how to get to the complimentary uh, website, the complement which, which has all of the digital resources. So uh, we thank you so much again for making this event. For many of us, it is the, uh, it's a, it's the favorite event of the, of the UC. Uh, for those of us who are scientists, who identify uh, with the scientific community, uh, who are citizen or resident scientists, uh, who love science. So thank you so very much again, and please enjoy all of the special interest groups Today, many of them are biodiversity conservation focused. Uh, and thank you so much for, for attending.